Welcome to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Our programming today is sponsored by Awake Us Now Ministries. We are a ministry with a heart to see awakening in America. And now, here's Pastor Chris Dodge. We are living in an incredible day and age. Because our God is moving and he is moving around the world in ways that have not been seen since Pentecost. Just recently, in the last few days, received word from a mission organization here in in the United States, Frontiers USA, a mission organization that is committed to raising up individual believers and congregations who have a heart for people throughout the Islamic world. They've mobilized hundreds, thousands of individuals to work in some of the most difficult missionary areas in all of the world. And just in the last couple of weeks, they've shared a phenomenal story that I'd like to share with you of how God is moving in one of those Islamic lands. It's the story of a young man. We're going to call him Hamid. That's not his real name. But Hamid came to know Jesus rather recently, through the testimony of his own brother who had become a follower of Isa al-Masih, Jesus the Messiah. Hamid intellectually accepted the gospel of Christ, the good news that God loved this world so much he sent his only son to offer himself as a living sacrifice for our sin, to go to the cross, to experience hell on Calvary's cross for you and for me. Hamid believed that, believes that he has risen from the grave and became a follower of Jesus, but quietly. Because Hamid lives in an area where it is dangerous to be a follower of Jesus. And so he kept his faith to himself for many, many days. Until he and his brother got in contact with a a mission worker, we're going to call him Dennis. Who encouraged them to not only read the Bible, but to spend time with God daily. Quiet time with the living God, searching the scriptures, allowing God to speak to the heart and to transform them from within. For Hamid and his brother, that was something that was totally foreign to them. And they experimented for a number of days and then for several weeks. Hamid began to read the Bible like he had never read it before. In fact, he had taken the Bible to a park in the area where he lives, in the city where he dwells, and was reading the scriptures when a police officer passed by and saw what he was doing. Hamid was immediately arrested. He was thrown into jail in a bare cell and left there overnight. It was the most frightening thing Hamid had ever experienced in all of his life. As he lay there on the cold floor all by himself, fearful about what lay ahead in the next day. All he could do was cry out to God. He slept fitfully that night. But during the night, he had a dream that changed everything. During the night, in a dream, he saw Jesus come to him. And in that dream, he saw Jesus place a blanket upon him. And soon, Hamid awakened for the day. He was startled by what he discovered when he woke up. He said when he awakened, he felt a peace in his soul that he had never known before. And then he realized he was covered with a blanket. And the blanket was the same blanket he had seen in his dream as Jesus placed it upon him. When the guards came to the cell that morning, they were absolutely astonished because there had been no blanket in the cell when they threw Hamid in there the previous day and night. And they were scared to death. They let him go, Hamid in his blanket. And Hamid said at that point he realized that no matter how dangerous the situation may be, No matter how great the persecution, the Lord Jesus never abandons his own. He never leaves his own behind. He is there and we can be calling upon him in any circumstance and in any situation and know that he is near and he loves his children. Guess what? 
The next night, Hamid had another dream. (laughs) And this time in the dream, the Lord Jesus told him when he went to work the next morning, he was to talk to the first two co-workers he saw about his faith in Jesus. That morning when Hamid went to work, he obeyed what he had been told in the dream. The first two co-workers who approached him, he immediately told them what had happened and about the Lord Jesus and his life-transforming power. Guess what? They said, I can believe that. And so those two co-workers began meeting with Hamid in the days that followed. They started studying the scriptures together, and they became followers of Jesus. And in the last year, Hamid has now established seven home groups where over 40 men and women have come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What an awesome God we serve, and what a powerful Lord we have at our right hand to defend, uphold, protect, and move. I love it when I hear those testimonies. I've heard testimonies from a number of you who have talked to me about the way God has moved in your life. I know what I've seen in my own life and in the lives of those close to me. He is an awesome and mighty God, a good and gracious Savior. But you know, the more I've reflected on the story of Hamid, something else has come to mind. And that's this. What if the Lord Jesus doesn't come back during our lifetime? What if Hamid lives to see his great-grandchildren? What will they know, worship, and love? It struck me. Will they be worshiping Hamid's magic blanket? Or will they be worshiping the Lord Jesus, whom their great-grandfather Hamid knew, loved, and served? Every generation, every generation needs to confront the living God personally, face-to-face, and come to grips with the incredible power of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the Heavenly Father and the movement of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that gives us insight into one of the strangest and one of the most perplexing, at least on the surface, accounts we have in all of the Bible. It's the basis of today's message, which is entitled Nahushtan. If you're wondering what in the world is a Nehushtan, here's the answer. If you'd open your Bibles this morning to the book of 2 Kings chapter 18. 2 Kings chapter 18. This is an account of an event that took place about 700 years before the coming of Jesus. It was during a time when God's people were truly on the ropes The ten northern tribes of Israel had been defeated ultimately in battle and scattered all across the Middle East and the Mediterranean. Only the two tribes in the south, Judah being the primary one, remained. They had had a succession of bad kings. But then there came a noble king who knew the living God, who encountered God's goodness and faithfulness, and sought to bring revival in the people of Jerusalem and the people of Judea. This is what we read, 2 Kings chapter 18. I'm going to begin at verse 3. This is the account of King Hezekiah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made, for up to that time the Israelites had been burning incense to it. It was called Nehushtan. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him. 
He kept the commands the Lord had given to Moses. And the Lord was with him. Wow. Here is a king who follows in the footsteps of his father who was a disaster. But Hezekiah knew the Lord. Hezekiah understood that genuine faith is not a matter of simply passing on the traditions from long ago. It is a matter of knowing God and understanding his incredible mercy and grace. And so as Hezekiah came to the throne and called the children of Israel back to the living God, Among the things he did was to tear down all of the false idols, all of the false places of worship. But in the midst of that, he also destroyed something else. And it seems to be, well, it seems to be contrary to what you would expect. Because Hezekiah destroyed one of the greatest religious artifacts ever known. He broke up into pieces the bronze snake that Moses had made 700 years earlier. It was called Nahushtan, the bronze thing. And people were actually worshiping the snake rather than the God who had delivered them. And so Hezekiah destroyed that thing. As a result, When archaeologists comb through the ruins of the ancient world, we are never going to find that snake on a pole. It has been destroyed. The children of Israel knew what that was all about because around 1400 B.C., as they were fast approaching the Promised Land and going through what is today southern Jordan, they began to complain and gripe and grumble against God and against Moses. They said, we're tired of this wilderness. We're tired of walking around here. We're tired of not having enough water. And we are absolutely sick of the food we have to eat. It was supernatural food. Manna from heaven. And they're grumbling. And so the scripture says in Numbers 21, the Lord sent serpents among them who bit many of them. And people began to die. You know what happens when people find themselves in desperate situations? They cry out to God. They cried out to Moses and said, we've sinned against God. What can we do? And the Lord told Moses, make a bronze snake. Put it on a pole. And whoever lifts up their eyes and looks to that snake, they will be healed. Now, it seems like a strange thing to do. But what God was saying is, You walk by faith. You live by faith. You trust his word. You trust his promise. You trust his goodness. You trust his healing power. You trust him to deliver you. And all who looked up and beheld that snake were healed. God moves in a mighty way. And the people realize the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. But in the generations that followed what happened, they started worshiping the snake rather than the God who had delivered their ancestors. In every generation and in every age, God calls people back to himself. And dear friends, that was what he is doing around the world today. In the nation where I grew up, in America, where we have wandered so far from the truths of our ancestors. God is today calling people to repent and calling them back to himself, calling people to understand the depth of the Father's love in Jesus Christ, calling them not to worship the traditions, but to worship God. Throughout all generations, that's what our God does. In fact, Jesus even talked about Nehushtan. Did you know that? He talked about the snake that Moses had made some 1,400 years before Jesus' coming, 700 years before Hezekiah was born. Jesus talked about what God did through Moses, talked about it to a religious leader who is about as religious as you can be. 
He's described in the scriptures as being a teacher of the Jewish people. His name, Nicodemus. He came to Jesus at night one day and said to him, after seeing the mighty things that Jesus had been doing in Jerusalem, after experiencing the incredible miracles that our Lord had wrought, Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God because no one could do the things that you are doing unless God was with him. And what did Jesus say? He didn't say, well, thank you so much for that compliment. I really appreciate that. I'm glad you recognized my incredible powers. I'm thankful that you, unlike many of the other religious leaders, have an open mind. No, Jesus looked at him and said, you need to be born again. You need a spiritual rebirth. You need to be born from above. That's what Jesus said to him. And Nicodemus Nicodemus was perplexed at best and clueless at worst. He said, how can I be reborn? Can't go into my mother's womb and be born a second time. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, born anew, born from above of water and the Holy Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then Jesus said this, amazing words. If you've got your Bibles, would you open them to the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. This is what our Lord said. Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life In him. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Remember that bronze thing? That bronze serpent that Moses made? He said, Just as the children of Israel looked to that and obeyed the living God and trusted his word and lived, Jesus said, So the Son of Man will be lifted up, lifted up in glory, and lifted up on the cross. And whoever looks to him, whoever looks to him, Jesus says, will have eternal life. Do you know that is the first time those two words appear in the Gospel of John, eternal life. They will appear a total of 17 times in that Gospel. But here is where it starts with the bronze thing. And Jesus says you need the real thing. You need to not only know what happened long ago, you need to know what God is doing now. You need to understand not simply the way the Lord has moved in the past, but you also need to comprehend how God is moving today in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nicodemus was brought face to face with the real thing. And his life was changed. We don't know a lot more about Nicodemus, but we do know two things. We know that after this encounter with Jesus, Nicodemus would actually stand up for Jesus. That sounds like a song, doesn't it? It, Nicodemus would actually stand up for Jesus in the ruling council, the Sanhedrin at Jerusalem. And he would defend him and say, we should not judge a man until we've heard everything. And then Nicodemus, on the darkest day in human history, but the brightest light the world has ever seen, Nicodemus would ask for the body of Jesus along with Joseph of Arimathea and would bury him. Nicodemus had encountered the real thing. I trust and pray that Nicodemus not only knew that Jesus died, but later came to grips with the fact that he is alive. And I look forward to seeing him in glory. Jesus says, as the Son of Man is lifted up, whoever believes in him will have eternal life. The Greek words that are used there are words that translate 
a Hebrew phrase that is found only once in the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, which says, Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake on the last day. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, some to everlasting life and others to shame and everlasting contempt. And the fact of the matter is, you and I do not want to miss eternal life. It begins the moment we come to know Jesus as our Savior. But it is going to achieve its fullness when he returns, when the dead are raised, when we behold him face to face, and when we reign with him forever in a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells, where the curse of Eden is destroyed and life without sorrow or tears or aging or death is now a reality, eternal life. It's what Jesus offers. And the next word we read in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, right after verses 14 and 15, well, it is one of the best known words in all of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. That's what God gives. And that is what he offers to each and every one of us. And it's not simply an insurance policy for when we're dead and gone. It is life now and life forever. Our destiny is not to be a disembodied spirit floating in the clouds. Our destiny is to be raised like Christ, to be with him and like him. When Jesus arose... He was no longer bound, shall we put it this way, by space and time. He appeared at will. He went through doors and walls. He showed up in the most unexpected of places. He met people along the road. And he talked to them in the wee hours of the night. He ate with them. He drank with them. And he said, I'm coming back. And dear friends, that is not something we want to miss. It's just that simple. Whatever is going on in your life, whatever your experience has been, God has so much for you and for me. And what he offers us is not simply a history lesson of the past. He offers us himself. He offers us a relationship with him. He is the one whom the Apostle Paul tells us is the one who has received the name that is above every name. The name of Yehovah, the name of Yahweh, the Lord. His name, Yeshua or Yehoshua, Jesus, literally means Yahweh, Yehovah, is salvation. He saves. He is the real thing. And he offers life to all who call upon him. Just as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness, that whoever looked at it might be healed. So Jesus says, whoever looks at the Son of Man and trusts him will be saved, will have eternal life. That is real life. And that is what God offers to you and me. Whether you have been a long-time believer, a new convert, or one who is still seeking and wondering and questioning, you need to know this. The Lord Jesus is near. He's near to you now. And he will answer all who call upon his name. And so let's do that right now, shall we? I invite you this morning to call on the name of the Lord because he will answer you and he will save you and that's his guarantee you've been listening to awake us now with pastor chris dodge our program is sponsored by awake us now have questions about today's message text us at 612-545-5654 or email us 
at mail at awakeusnow dot com and please come back and join us again next time.